President Mohammed Buhari and the President of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan, has urged the media to express its freedom with responsibility and without recklessness. Now, Lawan also admonished the media to purge itself of bad eggs, promising that the National Assembly won't pass anti-press legislations. The president also charged those who manage government information to do everything in the public interest, while also encouraging the media to use the Freedom of Information Act to make its job easier. Well, joining us to discuss this is Dikbo Olayoku, he's a journalist, and Tommy Boladi, a media consultant. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. I'm going to start with you, Dikbo. The president has, uh, and the Senate president, obviously, like I said, have asked the media to express its freedom responsibly. Um, firstly, I'd like to ask if the press is free in Nigeria. Do we experience some form of freedom to an extent, or do we have press freedom in Nigeria? Yes, thank you for having me on this special day of uh, the World Press Freedom Day. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we can comparatively, we can say the Nigerian media or press has a certain degree of freedom. But by nature of our, our job, it is not always possible to be the friends of those people in government. It's just like when they say man is born free, everywhere you go, you see man in chain. The same thing applies to the press in Nigeria or in most countries. Yes, there is always the assurance of press freedom, but everywhere you go, you see the press in chains. And these chains could be in form of legislation and in form, it could be in form of um, actions and activities of people in government. If you look at section 22 of the Nigerian constitution that specifies the function of the press, you will know that by virtue of this constitution, by virtue of this position, by virtue of this section rather, the press in Nigeria is like when they are running battle with people in government. But one good thing that uh, have always given us joy is that at the end of the day, the press or the ink always please prove to be mightier. That is why one newspaper came up with the slogan, pen is mightier than gone. But for the issue of press freedom, generally, I, I think I will align myself with the president's uh, submission. Because everywhere, uh, by virtue of training, by virtue of assignments, we always look at press freedom from one leg. We don't always look at the second leg of press freedom. And that is why there's always conflict between people in government and then we, the practitioners. Especially if you like that the today's uh, World press, press Day Day, usually celebrated on the 3rd of May of every year, it talks about to remind the government of their need to respect the commitment to press freedom. That is the first leg. And the second leg of the celebration of World Press Freedom Day is a day of reflection among media practitioners on issues of press freedom and professional ethics. This thing is very, very key. Being from the perspective of, oh, you are free to write, just as what uh, Section 39 of the Nigerian Constitution says, freedom of expression, either to receive or impact information. That one is, is basically. Let, let, At the same time, this responsibility of this freedom, rather, comes with a great responsibility, which we are going to expand on as the program progresses. Okay, I, I want to bring Tommy into this conversation. I mean, responsibility, press freedom. I mean, like you said, we are supposed to be responsible for whatever we put out. Um, Responsible reportage is also very important because as we speak, before you wake up in the morning to look for the papers or turn on the radio, social media is already agog with the stories. Hence why social um, newspapers and media houses have also gone to social media. But then the press has its job cut out for it, meaning that we have to 
you know, deal with issues of sieving the truth, you know, bringing the facts out. But there's a lot of propaganda on social media, and sometimes this propaganda is being put out by politicians. So how can the media stay above board in this situation? Especially in Nigeria, we see all sorts every day. And most of the time, it's social media that brings up or whips up these sentiments that sometimes could cause somebody to lose their lives or, you know, cause some form of tension in a certain area of the country. So Tommy, as someone who's played in this space for a long time, we do have our job cut out for us, but how do we keep our heads above water? Because the times really seem to be tough. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Marianne. Um, the times are, are changing, I would say. Um, I think now more than ever, um, journalists need to work with greater speed and efficiency than um, they're used to in the past. Newspapers at this time of the day would have um, finished their production for the day and um, they would go to bed and probably assemble again around midday the next day. Um, the, well, pretty much the same for newspaper and, and for TV and radio. But now things have changed. Um, we are now in a 24-hour news cycle. Um, it hasn't been helped by technology that we now have uh, available to us. So if we don't report what is happening, there's somebody on Twitter or Instagram or any of these social media platforms that's going to break it, that's going to beat us to it. And I think um, a lot of journalists are under the pressure of not wanting to be outdone by people on social media. And that leads sometimes to people making mistakes. But what I would say is that um, we shouldn't get carried away by social media and um, these new technologies that have been made available we need to stick to the good old way of um, um, gathering our news, um, running it through the usual processes of um, um, double checking to ensure that your facts are right, um, attributing and all of that. Yes, there's a need to rush and print and publish. There's a need to do that so that you don't lose audience, so that your audience don't find a new source for their information. But it's more important for you to disseminate what is right than um, to put out um, what is um, um, fictitious or what is fake. I mean, I think the term now is fake news. So for those of us who still work within um, conventional um, news environments, we cannot get too carried away by social media. And that's not to say that we shouldn't use social media. We should use social media, but we should ensure that the way we use it amplifies the good work we are doing in our newsrooms, wherever we find ourselves, whether radio, TV, or print, um, and not get carried away. We, we are in an era where people want to be the first to break it on social media, where people are looking for clicks on their website, so they are quick to just publish um, anything. Uh, the way I put it is they, they shoot first and ask questions later. We cannot fall into that trap, um, especially as we find ourselves in the in a very um, complex situation where in a country where there isn't um, quite a lot of um, the, the citizenry isn't so educated, so they can't tell one from the other most times. They look up to us to ensure that all of the facts, that we, all of the news that we disseminate are properly resourced and um, have gone through the process and will not cause harm to them. So if we want to now get into that rat race of rushing to social media or rushing to print first, without doing our due diligence, what is going to happen is that we are going to be entrenching this behavior of, um, of just putting out false information, jumping in on the propaganda, um, biting the bait that people have put out on social media. You are right, Marianne. Quite a number of people um, are now setting agenda, sometimes mischievously, a lot of times mischievously on social media. For those of us who work in conventional news environments, we need to ensure that we, we look at it two times, three times before we say, oh, this is something worth pursuing. This is something that is actually um, self-serving and we will not be a part of it. So we just need to be a bit more aware and not get, um, car get carried away by the frenzy of social media, um, which sometimes can be misleading. Let's talk about this post-truth era that we all find ourselves in. Um there are times where the journalists or the media practitioners go through the trouble of digging up this information with the facts that come with it. And the same government that's asking us to be responsible comes out to call it fake news because it's not serving them at that point. And then 
according to Mr. President in, you know, um, the speech that was put out, um, that we need to, you know, be sensitive, especially uh, in the situation that we find ourselves now with, you know, ethnic, um, uh, uh, different ethnicities, uh, you know, fighting each other. We're having um, numbers that are not certain. Sometimes the police will say it's two. Uh, the government will come out and say it's five. Really, is it the media? Because most of the time when I'm talking to people on my show, they keep blaming the media. It's the media's fault. But then the government needs to share its blame or responsibility in playing a part in all of these things that are happening. And what is happening in Nigeria today has become what it is because maybe our governments were too quiet about it or they let it get to this point. So again, does this not frustrate the job of a journalist in doing due diligence, digging up information, getting facts, and then at the end of the day, the government says it's fake news? Uh, yes, you see, we are an endangered species, so to speak, in the manner of speaking, because uh, both the government and the society see you as a threat. You have instances where some journalists have gone to cover events, there are some mishaps, other um, riots, um, natural disasters. And you find out that the victims of this instance will visit their anger on the journalists. That one is there. But on the part of government, government see the journalists or the press as a rival. But that does not take us, should take us away from our responsibility. I am very, very happy with the team of this year's celebration. Information as a public good. And when I saw that public good, I underlined it. But is the responsibility of a journalist. There is an example I always cite when I'm in this kind of a discussion. In, in uh, 2001, the, oh, sorry, this uh, popular 9-11, the American invasion, I think it was 2001 or 2011, I can't remember again, the 9-11 stuff. After about four or five days of the reportage of these events, when the newsroom, when a colleague just pointed my attention to, he said, general, people. Did you notice that in, since I've been watching this news analysis, news of uh, this uh, invasion, that no American television station has shown the body of an American being pulled out from the rubble? It was an observation from a colleague in his room. That was when I even became conscious of it. They were giving us figures. They were thinking us like they were giving us life feeds of uh, how they were doing uh, the recovery or the rescue operations. But they never showed one body of an American being pulled out of the rubble. About six months later, I went on a course. Then I came across some international journalists, some of them from America, from Britain. Then I opened a discussion. And one of the journalists from America told me this, this is what he said. He said, in American station, we will show an American body being pulled out of the rubble. He said, this one has, to, it has something to do with regulation. It is self-regulation because it is going to affect the sensibility of an average American. That is journalism at its best. Hmm. It is not the regulatory agency. So as a journalist, you have responsibility. Hello? As a journalist, you have the responsibility that this news I am pushing out, will it serve the public good? What is going to be the effect of this news on the society? Hmm. Is, it going to, is, it, is, it, is it going to endanger peace, uh, peace or endanger peace? So I, I think that should be our major focus, especially as Nigeria is passing through a very difficult time. Okay. Yes, we have Section 22 that has provided, that has covered us, giving us protection to do whatever you want to do. You have the FOI uh, Freedom of Information Act, which has given you some degree of freedom to do whatever you want to do. I, I really, I really wish I had time. I really wish I had time. I would have, I would have gone into the FOI issue, but let me just quickly pose this question to Tommy because we're out of time. He, Mr. Olayoku has brought up the issue of safety, um, the section in the Constitution that covers us as journalists. But really, are we covered? Where is Daddy Yatta? Let me start with that. People are still asking that question, the journalist. Um, safety of journalists is also a, a key thing. I mean, when I was on the radio, people would say, you're not doing investigative journalism. You're not going to. And I always say, 
give us insurance and then we can go do this. But in Nigeria, there seems not to be, it's, that's not factored into, you know, your salary, your allowances. How safe is the average Nigerian journalist, especially the ones who are investigators, the ones who have to do the, the digging up and, you know, the dirty work? Um, what is the safety that is given to us, aside from what, you know, is being pointed out in the Constitution, are we really safe to go about our businesses knowing that, you know, this is Nigeria and we have seen precedences. Uh, I mean, I don't even want to go as far as the ones that we were born to hear, uh, the, the likes of Dele Giwa. So really, is it safe to practice journalism in Nigeria, especially if you're an investigative journalist, Tommy? Uh, um, it's not safe. It's not, and, and really in Nigeria, nothing really is safe. Um, as a banker, I don't think you, you're... Um, you're safe um, if you work in oil and gas. There's no industry particularly that has any kind of um, covering. Um, but I think what makes a journalist unique is the fact that um, more than uh, most other professions, um, the journalist's job is to um, unearth um, information, is to dig, dig information. And sometimes it comes with some risk. Um, you've mentioned Dele Giwa, there's Bagada Kato, and so many other people. Um, who have died in the course of doing their job. Um, but even at that, it hasn't stopped people. People are still doing it. I think it's just the passion to deliver the news to people um, and deliver it without um, influence or without threats from any quarter is what drives a lot of journalists to do it. But by and large, um, we don't have a lot of covering in Nigeria, and particularly as journalists, we don't. there isn't the, the guarantee that um, a story you are working on isn't going to lead to your ending. Um, uh, you mentioned welfare of journalists. A lot of journalists are poorly paid. Um, a lot of them don't have um, um, insurance cover. They don't have um, um, the safety net they need to do their jobs um, professionally. They have to think of their welfare, think of their safety first before they even think of pursuing any particular story. Some of the big stories you've heard out of Nigeria, big um, investigative pieces you've heard out of Nigeria, um, in the last couple of years have been done by independent um, investigative journalists who get funding from um, certain organizations to do this or, or journalists who work with international um, media outfits um, who have all of these cover, who can provide them with actual physical security cover if they want to go, to, go into dangerous places uh, and they have um, um, full insurance cover for them in case anything happens to them. But for most Nigerian journalists practicing around the country, there isn't um, the assurance that they would have um, that they will be taking care of if anything happens to them or, or that they would even get the kind of support they need while doing these pieces. And I think that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of um, um, investigative pieces coming out of Nigerian newsrooms because there's that fear. Um, people, people think of their, of their life, of their livelihood first before they even pursue any story. Um, so really, I, I really can't blame anybody, but these are the problems that we face. Um, you know, so to answer your question, yes, there isn't any safety in Nigeria as a whole, but journalists suffer it um, a whole lot more than um, in the professional because of the nature of the job we do. Um, so, yeah. Well, I want to say thank you, Adura Tomi Balade, uh, Dikwa Olayoko. Thank you very much for being part of this conversation. I would love to continue because there's lots and lots to talk about, but thank you so much for being here. You're, right. You're welcome. Well, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, I will give you my take. Stay with us. <laughs>